So welcome to session number 24 in the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. Uh, this time we're looking at um, Fritz, it's supposed to be pronounced Lieber, but almost everybody I know says Lieber, so I'm going to say Lieber because that's what I've said my entire life too. Uh, Fritz Lieber, um, and his. we're looking specifically at his Fofford and the Grey Mouser stories, which are set in this uh, you know, fantasy world of New Han and the city of Lankmar, and I'll talk a bit about you know, this, this narrative world. Um, as usual, I, I picked you know, some philosophical themes, and one of the handouts is, is connected directly to that. The first theme was, was going to be just talking about swords and sorcery itself, which is the genre not only of these works, but, but Lieber played a major role in creating that genre. So um, we'll talk a bit about that. Um, the handout is about friendship, and these two guys, Fofford and the Grey Mouser, are sort of like, you know, there's, there's this literature of, of friendship, um, like throughout the ages, these people who are connected with each other. These two are, are like that. Um, the third theme I want to talk about is what, I, I was struggling to figure out what I want to call it, and so now I, I came up with a uh, formulation. The ethics of roguery, you know, can a rogue be a good guy, or are, they, are these really bad guys? that are sort of anti-heroes dressed up as, as good guys. And so that's an open question. Um, I also want to talk about, you know, um, you know where women fit into the, the story and how, how Lieber depicts them. And then there's the other thing was about the gods and, and this, this cosmos that he creates and the weird, funny ways that the gods get depicted, which is not very reverent at all. <laughs> You know, so, um, so I, you know, as usual, I, I created a um, kind of a, a timeline about about his long life. You know, he died in 1992. He was 82 years old. Um, lived a good portion of it as a, as a married person, and then you know was alone, uh, living in a, a small apartment, uh, writing away for for a good portion of it as well. And I put the, the um, stories that fit into this series in, in um, dark, so you can see you know, where they fit in with this. Um, I, I should mention that all of the, except for one novel, one actual novel, um, all of the books in this series are collections of, of, of stories. And sometimes they can be very short stories, like maybe five, ten pages. Sometimes they're quite long, but they're all, they're all stories, and they were originally published for the most part, in these pulps that we've talked about a lot. Um, and Lieber probably made a lot of money <laughs> looking at it for these pulp magazines because he contributed so much to it. I didn't put all of the stuff that he wrote in here because there's like, you know, 15 collections of short stories, and, and you know, I, I just wanted to concentrate on, on this stuff. So um, I put those in there. I got into Lieber when I was young um, in two ways. One was through actually reading stories that he'd written, um, many of which were not from, from this set, but were you know like in the Science Fiction Hall of Fame or things like that. And the other was through playing D&D, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Lee, Lieber is kind of unique in that he was so important to um, Gary <coughs> Gygax, or Gygax, however it's pronounced, that um, he was actually able to lease his characters to TSR, uh, and they became part of the, the whole mythos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, how many other people can you say that about? I mean, if you read um, the, the books that... that used to like be the core of D&D. I don't know what it is now because I haven't played it for, for decades, but you know, you had like this dungeon master's guide and he was giving you advice about how to create worlds and stuff like that. And he'd sometimes say stuff like, well, just look at what Fritz Lieber does. <laughs> so, you know, he was clearly uh, very impressed with them. And I think, you know, Lieber, I mean, he had massive cultural influence, but I think that sort of amplified it in a way. Um, he also starred in a few movies, believe it or not. Um, in roles that were uncredited. <laughs> his parents were actors. And uh, his dad started some movies. 
and somehow got, got Fritz into it. And so he was in some, some early movies. Uh, he didn't really take it very seriously. Um, never made a career out of it or anything like that. You know which ones? I, I don't offhand. I, I should have written them down, but um, there wasn't anything that rang a bell with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, but I, I'm not a very good good movies guy in that way. So let's <clears throat> let's talk about his life. So born in Chicago, he'll he'll live in Chicago for a lot of his life. Um, the other places that he tends to live are Los Angeles and uh, San Francisco, and you could say that most of his life is kind of, you know, in the, in that triangle. It would be a very, what do you call it? You know, the, tr the scaling is it? Uh, you know, a uh, very long triangle. And uh, with he, I, I should mention he also did live in New York for a short period. So he is born to two actors people who are actually professional actors making a living doing that sort of work in Chicago. Um, when he's 18, he actually tours with his parents' Shakespeare company, and after that he enrolls at University of Chicago. Very bright guy, so he has no problem with that. He graduates with honors. He actually didn't get a BA. He got a bachelor's in philosophy degree, uh, a BPhil or BPH or something like that. And um, he, he goes off, he thinks he, he might have some sort of calling, so he goes off to New York and he studies at an Episcopalian seminary uh, for a very short time, uh, less than a year, um, at a general theological seminary, leaves that, comes back to University of Chicago, starts graduate work, never finishes it. Um, and instead, he um, starts working with his parents again, um, doing, you know, various odd jobs and, and, and filling in. And he also starts writing um, stories. And not long after that, he's going to marry uh, his first wife, uh, John Quill Stevens. And he begins a correspondence with somebody who's really important in his early work, and that's H.P. Lovecraft. This, unfortunately, is about a year before Lovecraft dies. But there is a correspondence between the two of them, and a lot of Lieber's early work is uh, not just in the horror genre, but also Lovecraftian. You know, sort of like um, you know, you, you've got to you've got to learn from other people. You know, a lot of writers, their early stuff, you can clearly see the influences of, of other people. So Lovecraft was a major influence. Um, he, he manages to get work as a, a writer for the Standard American Encyclopedia. That's going to continue on until um, he, he leaves uh, and travels to California and becomes an instructor at Occidental College. <clears throat> and meanwhile, his, his son is, is born, um, the only child that, that they're going to have. When the war comes, um, he leaves his nice position at the university uh, after the year is finished um, to contribute to the war effort. He becomes a quality inspector at Douglas Aircraft, and you might say, well, why didn't he just, you know, go off and fight? Well, you know, look look at the, the years. He'd have been in his early 30s, uh, had a wife and, and kid. Um, so, you know, a lot of people went, went and started working in factories or things like that for, for the war. And he did it precisely because he, he thought that resisting fascism was so important. Um, there might have, as a little side note, there might have also been a bit of... Um, worries about being German involved as well. Um, you know, in World War I, uh, we, we often forget just how, how many Germans there were here in the United States. You know, at one time, it was about 10% of the population of the United States was German. And during World War I, there actually was a German plot <laughs> to try to get, you know, Mexico to come in and all sorts of things like that. The German ambassador got held and uh, all sorts of crazy stuff was going on. So there was a lot of anti-German sentiment. And this guy, unfortunately, his name is Fritz. So, you know, that's the, the, the name for Germans, right? Uh, that or Herman, right? Herman the German. And um, so he, he was kind of sensitive about that. And, and then in, in a World War II, um, I think he might have felt that he needed to contribute. He stressed, here's something he actually wrote. He says, there's a lot in a name, 
Um, I'm forever having to explain <coughs> that it's pronounced Liber, not Lieber, and ca correspondingly spelled, you know, E-I, not I-E. Um, and then he said that, you know, Fritz was, was also a problematic name. That he found teachers and friends who wouldn't accept that, that somebody would, would be a patriotic American with, with a name like that. Interestingly, his paternal grandfather um, was a German immigrant and had served on the Union side in the Civil War, and his mother's American roots could be traced back to the Revolution. So he had some sort of bona fides, but there may have been some sensitivity about that. In any case, he, he's there. Uh, when the war ends, they, they move back to Chicago, and he becomes an editor of Science Digest. And he, by now, he's already writing. Um, his first major book is, is really a book piece of horror, um, Conjure Wife, which is about a wife who, who happens to be uh, a witch. And, um, you know, then some of the other things are, are sci-fi or, or fantasy. And he's, you know, we've talked about um, George R. Martin before, and Martin, I think I had on, on one of these handouts, Martin was saying something like, Ah, you know, uh, fantasy, horror, sci-fi, it's pretty much all the same thing. You just, like, put ray guns in the hands of the, the sci-fi people and swords in the hands of the other, and then set it in, you know, some eldritch castle if it's horror, something like that. And I think Lieber has that kind of, kind of you know, facility of moving between genres uh, in, in the same way. Um, Harlan Ellison, who's somebody who Lieber influenced quite a bit, I think would be another person who you could say the same thing about. Uh, he can move between these different genres. Um, so now, he, he also, um, I should mention, there, this is kind of, this is something that does affect his life. You notice that in 1957, he begins participating in Alcoholic Anon Al Alcoholics Anonymous. You do that because you're an alcoholic. And it had really presented a lot of problems for him. Um, it's, you know, he gets it under control, but then later on when his wife dies, uh, he really goes to pot. And um, not only does he get, start drinking again, but he starts using some drugs, um, creates some, some financial setbacks for him. Um, Harlan Ellison writes at one point about finding um, Lieber in this, this tiny little apartment with, you know, books and crap all around, you know, hammering away on a cheap typewriter and being like, what, you know, what the hell's going on here? And it was in part because of his, his addictions. Um, you know, it, it's, it, you, you read the stuff that he wrote and it's so, um, as literature, it's so erudite and so well put together and you think, wow, what would this guy have accomplished if he hadn't had, had um, those challenges going on? You notice that he's already, by the 50s, starting to get recognized. Um, he's going to win quite a few awards, be a guest of honor, get you know inducted into all sorts of things. I only put some of those. And one of the really cool things, and I haven't been able to track down the actual year for this, because there's another guy, El Sprague de Camp, who we're going to look at later on, who also is a, a member, founding member of this, the, um, uh, it's called Saga, uh, the, the Swordsmen and Sorcerers Guild of America. Um, this was a group of, of writers who got together, very select, um, the sort of big names in swords and sorcery fantasy, and they would like get together and drink and, and you know, hang out and tell their stories. Sort of like, you know, um, what was the name? It was the Inklings, right, that, that uh, Tolkien and Lewis and some of the other people had over there in England. This was sort of like that. Um, and they would induct other people later on, uh, you know, they bring in new blood. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, part of what's going on. Um, eventually, like I said, his wife dies. Um, he moves to San Francisco um, and starts drinking again and, uh, you know, Things go on. He keeps producing stuff. Um, he's, he's quite a uh, productive author. Um, he even writes a play at one point. Uh, he wins not only awards in science fiction and fantasy, but also horror awards like the Bram Stoker Award. Um, and then the year that he actually dies, he wasn't in very good health anyway. He marries Margot Skinner, who is a, a close friend of his, um, and then, you know, not long afterwards, dies of, of a stroke. 
Um, 82, you know, that's pretty good for, for, for anybody, I think. Um, and to talk about the Fawford and the Gray Mouser thing. So the first, um, the first book that's published is Two Sought Adventure. Um, but he'd been writing this stuff beforehand. And there's, there's actually an interesting story about this. So um, he had a friend called Harry Otto Fisher. And Fisher was, I guess, from what Lieber says, they were sort of like Fawford and the Grey Mouser, those two guys together. And his friend um, Harry had sketched them out in a letter. And he, he wrote in this letter, For all do fear the one named the Grey Mouser. He walks with swagger amongst the bravos, though he's but the stature of a child. Um, so the Mouser is modeled on, on Fisher, and then Lieber is supposed to be this, you know, bigger, brawnier, uh, barbarian guy. And so it wasn't, it wasn't his own character. He really gets these from somebody else and takes them over, and then builds them into um, just story after story after story. So this is, this is an omnibus called The Three of Swords that has the first three uh, books in, in that series in it. Um, and then there's four more. So it gives you an idea of just how much stuff, just how much meat there is, right? And I, I'd read all of them at one point or time when I was a kid. And then rereading them for this, I, I'd recently read... Um, just a few years back, uh, Swords and Ice Magic, which is the last one where they're like middle-aged, settling down with these, these uh, women that they're not sure whether they're going to marry or not, uh, still having adventures, but, you know, kind of getting sedate, you know, having kids. Um, and, uh, and, and rereading these, these early things, he is just such a great writer. Um, I, I, you know, I, I remember enjoying this stuff before, but looking at it very carefully, Lieber has this amazing uh, facility to, to range from like writing about a fight scene, which is its own kind of writing, to you know, witty dialogue between these these two guys or other people, to depicting uh, what's going on, to writing stuff that's like just very, you know, very uh, well-written smut uh, to, you know, speculations about the gods. And he just like, go back and forth from one to the next, you know, easily. And um, not, not everybody does like his writing. Some people said, like, I don't know how he won a Hugo Award for this. It's, it's you know, boring. I don't find it boring at all. I, I thought it was actually quite, quite good. And um, you can see how all these other swords and sorcery people are, are influenced by him. Um, and you can see how it would, you know, kind of fit in with with D and D. Yeah. So um, when you said about the acting, I looked it up on IMDb. Oh, good. And there's something really interesting that I found, but I wanted to ask you. So the swords and sorcery stuff was yeah. that very distinct for him from like more kind of sci-fi traditional like monsters from the deep? Did he do a lot of that kind of writing? He wrote a lot of horror. Okay. Yeah. Because, do you want to know what I found out? It's, yeah. It's kind you of mean fascinating. The yeah, so there's another actor named Fritz Lieber who did a lot of classical, like, Shakespearean yeah. stuff, right? That's not him. Um, but uh, they're strange, all smushed strange together. His, 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 well, yeah, his parents had was, a Shakespearean company. Well, yeah, but this guy was born close enough that he, he was born in 1898. So it was someone else with okay. a similar name. And they're smushed together in IMDb. I just wanted to say that oh, in case okay. anyone decides to look it up. But so he acted in Equinox as Dr. Arthur Waterman, which was a, a sci-fi film from the 70s. Okay. Uh, four friends are attacked by a demon, um, like while picnicking. Ooh. And then he was <laughs> in something in 1979 called the Bermuda Triangle. But here's what's really fascinating. So in 1944, which is only a year after he published The Conjure Wife. Oh, yeah, it's turned into a movie. Weird Woman with, yeah, yeah with Lon Chaney. Yeah. Which is then remade twice... Yeah. Once as Burn Witch Burn in 62, and then a second time as Witch's Brew in 1980, and then also has its own episode in a TV series called Moment of Fear from the 60s. Okay. Was um, that sort of like the Twilight Zone? It was Conjure Wife. It was actually called Conjure Wife, and it was episode two. And, yeah, I mean, the people that are in this, are, it's fascinating because Lana Turner was in one of the remakes. Wow. Um, 
I think was that in Burnwich Burn. Okay. Uh, no, that's that's Janet Blair. Um, but yeah, Lana Turner was I think in the Witch's Brew remake. Yeah, with Terry Garr, interestingly enough, from 1980. But then he also wrote episodes for Night Gallery. Oh, that was yeah. uh, Stephen King's, right? No, that no. was Rod Sterling. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that was after the Twilight Zone, I think. Okay. It was, it was his horror. Departure. Oh, okay. And then he wrote the story for something that was produced in 1995 called The Girl with the Hungry Eyes, and then something that also a short called Mariana that was just made in 2011. He's credited for. But, that's interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's a lot of mileage for one story. Yeah, well, you, episode I guess, you know. and then you know three re- three movies. movies. Yeah. Some some people say that it's it's one of the best witch stories ever written. And it's the professor discovers his wife does magic. That's mm-hmm. the right one. Yeah. So. Yeah, although I think there's more to it. Right, but that's the synopsis. It's not just bewitched or something. No, 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 no. No, that's the IMDb. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) When you're talking about, you know, influences, because, you know, writers read a lot and get their sparks of imagination from different sources, something that was in the New York Times today, relevant to Shakespeare, and apparently these Shakespeare guys are all really excited, They've used the software that was developed for teachers to look for students cheating. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. turn it into Shakespeare's yeah. works to see well where was he drawing from, and so they're. I didn't get the whole story. I, didn't oh, wow. I ran out of time to finish so. it. But the same way that if somebody said where does I mean it's a new tool. You yeah, think, yeah. It's you plagiarism could find, software. Yeah. yeah, it's plagiarism software. But I mean, but not the. Yeah. Shakespeare was plagiarized, but you can go back maybe now and sort of do a hunt. He was borrowing from Marlowe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so you can find, well, look at there, like, Marlowe, like, in this discarded transcript that was never published from Marlowe, and there's yeah. the idea for all fellow. Like, a, like a turn of phrase, too. It'd be, I, I, I imagine if you took some of these books and you ran them through that, something would come up. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. Sure. yeah. So actually, that's, that's, a good, that's a good segue into talking about, like, so what are, what are his influences? I mentioned Lovecraft, but he read a lot, you know. Um, you know, Fawford and the Grey Mouser are are being drawn from. You know, Fawford is this northern barbarian. Clearly, he's like a Viking. As a matter of fact, there is one story where they wind up in Earth, and because there's like a you know one of the one of the wizards, Nin Gobble of the Seven Eyes, ends up putting them into an alternate universe, which is Earth, and Fawford is a Viking. And, and Grey Grey Mouser is from, if I remember right, from Tyre, which is one of the um, Phoenician cities, you know. Uh, so he's, he's a little kind of, you know, swarthy guy, shifty from the big city. Mm-hmm. Fawford is, you know, this... And, and he, he draws on a lot of um, sources um, to guess, try to weave all these things together. How does it, t- timing-wise, how does it match up with Conan the Barbarian? And that's... Howard. Um, well, that's something interesting. So, um, Howard starts Conan, right? But Howard doesn't finish Conan. Um, I don't know if Lieber actually wrote any Conan stories. There were quite a few other... I noticed he wrote a Tarzan story. Yeah, yeah. Although, so did um, uh, somebody else we've talked about, uh, Philip Jose Farmer, mm-hmm. right? Uh he does that, and he also does a Doc Savage story. Um, so I guess there's there's some characters that are kind of fair game. They become like public, you know, what would you call it? Like uh, public domain in a certain way. Um, I mean, Howard is 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 around the same time. Um, I think he gets, if I remember right, I want to say he gets started like in the, the 30s. Um, I could be wrong about that, though. That's somebody who we're going to talk about later on down the line because he's such a big, big hit. Again, somebody else who I read a lot of as a kid, too. Um, but, but with the Conan stories, quite a few of them are not by Howard. They're by, like, Lynn Carter or, you know... Um, Lieber might have written some. Lieber also contributed to, to Cthulhu Mythos stuff. Um... And there were a lot of people, you know, getting into that game after Lovecraft died. So, like, you know, we've talked about Durleth, who is from Wisconsin. Um, I'm just, I'm just thinking the that genre, the sword and sorcery yeah. genre, and that be uh, A. A. Merritt, yeah, and Howard and Lieber, and uh, Lynn Carter, 
right. are, there's a number of them yeah. that were all writing within that genre pretty yeah. close together. It's like it was a wave. Yeah. And so what what brought that about? You know, or <clears throat> what what spurred that? You know, because you had like kind of action, you had a lot of action stories before that, right? Um, but not not people like going at each other <clears throat> specifically with swords in ancient slash medieval times, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, usually set in like made up universes, not, not set here. Um, or if they were, they were like way back when Atlantis existed, you know, that sort of, mm-hmm. sort of business. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in a way, the sorcery part is kind of like so in science fiction, right, you've got, like, lasers and technology that can do all sorts of things. The sorcery could be just like that, you know. Um, I forget who, one of the people that we've, we've read said, um, you know, to, to uh, sufficiently un, undeveloped society, any sort of technology appears to be magic. It was one of the... Yeah, there we go, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that actually got turned into a law or something, right? Um, and so you get the sense that in some of the swords and sorcery stuff, the sorcery stuff could just as well be um, sci-fi stuff. It's you just get, been, I, was thinking, I was just saying, as we're talking about Marion Zimmer Bradley's series. Okay. She wrote a series, Dark Over. Yeah, yeah. Which the, source, the sword sorcery piece is paranormal yeah. mental powers. Yeah, and, and the, their, all of their power is is paranormal, uh, psychic powers. And, yeah, and there's sometimes connections with like the horror genre coming in too. You know, um, I mean, in a way, I mean we talk about these as like very distinct genres, but if you think about the pulps of the time, um, they had different bents. Like some were much more into. Um, you know, sci-fi, hard sci-fi, right? Don't bother me with that, that, you know, other stuff. But, I mean, the pulps encompassed a lot more than just those speculative fiction genres. They were also, like, the true crime stuff, which, a lot of which was, frankly, quite just pornographic, you know. So, you know, there's, there's sort of like a spectrum. The certainly were. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a spectrum of, like, I mean, this is the way some people, that, this is, like, we talked about um, C.L. Moore and the fact that her mom did not want her to write science fiction or even read this smut because it was probably on the same shelf as, like, you know, true crime and detective stuff, uh, you know, and even even the, the, the um, artwork for, for fantasy or, or science fiction was pretty racy, too, you know, I think. Mm-hmm. At the time, because they were trying to sell sell copies, <laughs> you know? so so and Lieber kind of Lieber fits into that very well. I, I remember so when I was reading the very first story again, um, like within just a few pages, there's um, there's there's a description of essentially a sex act taking place, um, some some foreplay, but it's written in such a way that if you weren't really paying attention to what's being said. You wouldn't catch it because Lieber is that good of a writer. <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, uh, he, he he certainly snuck this in. Um, so that's let, let's talk about his his world and, and world building. Um, he, you know, he's got this uh, place and he calls it Nuhan, and it's a play on words, sort of like Era One, you know, is nowhere. Um, uh, what is it backwards? Uh, uh, no, Nuhan is, is, it's not nowhere, it's, uh, no when, right? Yeah, no, no when, never took place. Um, so sort of like, instead of being utopia, uh, not a place, right, not a place that doesn't exist, it would be Uchronia, I guess you would say in Greek, a time that never existed. Um, but he devotes a lot of thought to telling us about this world, I mean, even down to like, this is, you know, this is the sequence of the days. Each day is, like, named after a different thing. Each month, each year. He tells us about the landscape, you know, how trading works. The city itself, where most of the action takes place, uh, Lankmar, is this very old city. 
and he talks about certain streets as being particularly important, and there's guilds, like there's a thief's guild, and uh, an assassin's guild, which is part of the, I think, the brotherhood of the, the bravos. There's a um, grain sellers guild, you know, merchants, then they, they control a lot. And it's a city that is just old as dirt, literally. It's, it's been around longer than anyone can remember. Um, it's even got its own gods who nobody prays to, and they just hope that they won't come out. I'll talk more about that when we get to the, the gods section. Um, and, and there's, like, always people on the make there. And, and, and Lieb, Lieber is really good at describing not just these two guys, but everyone else in the city and what their motives are and what their way of life is and, and what they're trying to do. Um, and then he adds in, you know, there's, there's other peoples. So there's like these people called the Mingles, who of course are the Mongols, you know, um, and, and they ride on the steeps and they also sail in ships and, and they're kind of quiet and, and, uh, but good, good companions and then all sorts of other people. Um, and, and so he develops an entire world where he never tells us exactly where things are. He's not like Tolkien, where he, like Tolkien would make maps and write out the languages and stuff like that. It's almost like he's making it up as he goes along. But it all fits together. Um, so, you know, to use the classification that we talked about before, like Tolkien being the architect and George R. R. Martin being the gardener, I think Lieber would be more of a gardener, but I think he's probably a better gardener than George R. R. Martin, you know. He maybe keeps things a bit more more tidy or something, I don't know. Hmm. Um, those of you who have read him, what, what do you guys think on that? Who've read both authors? I really haven't read much Lieber. Uh, Martin is a gardener is more jungle gardening. <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good way to put it. Yeah, he's got this line. I just you know put a seed there and water it and see what see comes what up. But it's more like he he just like you know you can buy like those uh, those big things of like wildflower uh, seeds. Yeah. yeah, and and they're basically weeds, right? So you just like cast the whole thing out there and see what comes up. You know, whatever strongest is going to survive. <laughs> that's Martin. How long has it been since the book has come out? Oh, oh, oh boy. Yeah. it's enough to make you skeptical of the approach. It's a number of years. Yeah. He hasn't made the last well, one yet. Well, so I mean, that's actually a good point. If you're if you're doing things in an architect kind of way, like you know Frank Herbert with Dune too is a, a kind of an architect type. You've got a lot of your, you know where things are going, right? You could like mm -hmm. you could actually like lay out like a weekly schedule. Okay, so this you know this is when this thing happens, and I need to write about that. But if you're a gardener, on the one hand, you also got to wait for inspiration, right? Uh, I don't know if I can write this character at this time. I don't know what they're going to do, you know? You don't have the master plan. Um, but then you also have to, like, figure out as you go along, what the hell are they doing? And, and who's doing what to who? And then you have to, like, make sure you keep track of it, too, so you don't have any... Um, not plot holes, but uh, inconsistencies, right? Uh, Lieber doesn't seem to have too much trouble with that. I, I don't know a lot of people pointing out inconsistencies with these various stories, so he must have been quite good at keeping track of all this stuff. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a really well-worked-out world. It's essentially, you know, early medieval mixed together with late antiquity, um, there's a lot of things that I think if you if you've studied history you can easily recognize as, as just sort of gussied up. Then of course there's the magical aspect. Um, magic does exist in this world. <clears throat> the gods do exist, although none of the gods are actually very powerful. Like, like you know, the way that we tend to think about God. Um, you know, a gardener. Even the gardeners, though, as writers, have to have <clears throat> some idea of where it's headed because, like Martin. There yeah. are hints in books, the early books, about what's going to happen in the later books. There are, yeah. some, there are some connections between the Targaryens and the other houses that you don't see the significance of it for three more books. Yeah. <laughs> but he obviously knew. Well, he's a great example, though, because he thought it was only going to be three books to start with. To start with. Right? And, and you notice the books keep getting longer and longer yeah, and longer, yeah. so... You know, by the time he gets to the seventh book, uh, some people have actually said too that now it's supposed to turn into an eight-book series. Who, I mean, who knows? The well, guy six, right? 
We're waiting on we're six, waiting six, yeah. And it's been like eight years, seven years? Well, and it's been announced oh, yeah. that it's, that it's coming years several years in a row. Yeah. But it was like that <laughs> so. with the fifth one. The fifth one was yeah, the yeah. Fifth one was delayed. The fifth one was People delayed. Yeah, and it's like that big too. I mean, yeah. look. I mean, look. So there's this is uh, three books. <laughs> this is yeah. three books, and it is uh, about five hundred pages, four hundred ninety-six. Yeah. So that is half the length of a Martin book. Yeah. The first one I think was the smallest, right? At eight. Uh, uh, yeah, eight hundred or seven hundred. Well, a lot of writers have been doing that. Uh, Rowling, her last book oh, yeah. in the Harry Potter series yeah, is true. huge. Yeah, Didn't they have yeah. to they bind it in two separate volumes, right, for the paper? No, they, they had to do that for the movie. Oh, the movie. Oh, okay. that's the, book is, the book is a single binding, but the movie they had to split into two. Into two. I suppose it's, it, some of it probably depends on like the conditions under which people write on there, right? Yeah, then a number of people, a number of writers have done that. It's yeah. either grown into more books, or and the books have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And Rice, that happened with her books. I mean, if you think about it, because, you know, the stuff that we write on has become so much more efficient, it's, it's easier to do that, I suppose, you know. You mean that the fact that you have like word processing and yeah, instead of a typewriter or instead of writing yeah, things by it, hand, or, or is it as you build the world? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're building, you're building, you're building the world, right? So, so, yeah. so as so the world gets bigger, you have more characters, you right, have yeah. more subplots. Yeah, yeah that's more, the same. You're building all this, and now you've got to pull all it these characters. It becomes more complicated, right? Yeah, more there's more levels. So you're writing to cover all those levels. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing. Is that so what what? Um, is it like a desire within the writer that they, they or like a compulsion, I need to like follow out these threads? You know, because I mean, we have some writers that we've talked about who just keep on hammering away, you know, uh, at their, their world, like Anne McCaffrey, for example, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps, too, if you get like an apprentice to come in and take it over like she did with her son. Uh, to, to do that. Well, Herbert did that. Yeah. Um, uh, Zimmer, Bra Marion Zimmer Bradley did that. Yeah. She Herbert did it a lot earlier. Yes, he did. Because, you know, he's only, he's only like four or five books in before I think his kid starts helping him out. <laughs> yeah. Whereas um, McCaffrey is, you know, over a dozen books in, I think, before he's he's getting involved. She, she. Uh, no, but her son. Oh. oh, her son, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, but is there is I mean is this something about a writer maybe that I mean, this could be an interesting philosophical theme when you become an author does your world and your characters start to take take you know, draw you in and, and well, require they, you to well, finish them out or? we're specifically talking about writers who build worlds yeah. Yeah. yeah and I I think it's the world building it's that desire maybe it's the desire to explore to, it? to build the world and explore it. Because if you're going to build a world, that's a lot of detail. Yeah. yeah. If you're really going to build a world, that's a lot of detail. Uh, that's an interesting and idea, yeah. if somebody is that into the detail, yeah, um, that could be a big piece of it. I think, too, like, when you think of things like the Star Trek mm -hmm. phenomenon. I mean, Star Trek universe. Yeah, yeah when, when worlds and universes and things like that are built, yeah. there becomes a point at which, I mean, look at how we're talking about Martin, like, come on. They kind of belong you know, to the fans. Yeah, we're all yeah. part of that world, too. And so, you know, to, to there's like almost like a compelling force that comes from the readers and the fans asking for more, right? Yeah. And so there's this world that, you know, I mean, you see that with mystery characters, I think, quite often, well, you too. Saw it's with another Sherlock genre. Holmes. Yeah. yeah. You saw it with Isaac Asimov with the robot books. Right. Okay, yeah. Because he didn't want to write anymore. Well, fans, and Herbert too with Dune. He didn't and want to Herbert, he didn't want to write anymore, but the fans just yeah. insisted. Yeah. I wonder. I mean, if you're an author, you could tell the fans, "Screw you! I'm not going to do anymore." Right? And and, and what can they do to you? you it's vilify. Wasn't it? Well, you, but if well, they can stop buying your books, so. yeah. <laughs> if you're an author, don't you want the? the well, I think that's part the, of it. The, yeah. The, you know the good the good feelings. Good graces. Of, of, good yeah. Of fans. yeah, I suppose. There's a mystery writer that my friend read. It Ian something. I don't. Do you read mystery? I thought you mentioned it. But I think he killed off the well, primary the protagonist, character. and there was such a backlash. They <laughs> had to like write this whole book to kind of bring him back to life. It was like well, that was a Sherlock. Holmes. They do the yeah. Sherlock Holmes. Well, yeah, yeah. Back to life. Exactly. <laughs> he killed off Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, and yeah. I remember. Fans went crazy. Well, and he that happens. Out how to bring him back. That happens with the TV series illusion. too. Yeah. That, that happens well, there's with a lot of resurrection sometimes. taking place yeah. in a lot of places. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, now it's got to the point where, like, 
each movie that comes out, they've already got like built in things so that they can have the sequel to it. Yeah. And you're like, ah, I know this person isn't really dead. You know, uh, at the end of the movie, we'll see their hand come out or something like that. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, that's, that's where we are today. I th- you know, I think when it comes to the first theme, the, the swords and sorcery, what, what is that? I think we've kind of talked through that already, right? Um, so let's talk about friendship. These guys, like I mentioned, are sort of like, you know, the archetype of like the, the, the good friends, like uh, Gilgamesh and, uh, what is it, Enki? Not, no, that's, the, that's one of the gods. Enkidu, yeah. Um, or, you know, some of the other companions throughout time these guys get called the twain, and it's hinted at that there's like a metaphysical basis to this, that they exist in different worlds together. Um, it begins with them separate, you know. Uh, Fawford is up north, and he's, he's trying to get out of it. He wants to get to civilization um, and, and get away from his, his mom and, and the other, you know, people of his, his uh, clan. And um, the mouser is studying with this wizard, um, there's a whole sort of origin story. Then they wind up in, in Lankmar together. Um, and they, they wind up both trying to rob the same thieves. Um, there, there's a great uh, passage where they're both disguised as pillars, and the thieves are walking past, and one pillar sees the other pillar move, and they, they're like, well, you know, I guess we'll rob them together. So they, they prey on these these thieves, and then everything gets, gets going after that. Um, and they do have, you know, some... Each of them has, has a, a love interest at the start um, that gets them to, to Lankmar, um, but both of them die. And so these two guys are, are together, and they become like the best of friends. There is a, a time when they part from each other, and they get ticked off with each other. So, so the mouser starts working for a uh, extortioner, and Fawford has a religious conversion and, and starts uh, working for this... this uh, almost senile priest who, who is uh, the one single priest of Isaac, I think it's Isaac, of the Jug. Um, I might be mixing it up. But um, the rest of the time, they're always together. And sometimes they, you know, they, they get become rivals or they, they get in fights, but they're always there for each other. And, and so I thought one of the things that could be interesting to talk about, there's this classic discussion of friendship in in Aristotle um, and types of friendship. And Aristotle says that, you know, it's okay to have different kinds of friends. Um, some of our friends are not very close. They're, they're the useful. And maybe we're useful to them and they're useful to us. These are, you know, maybe your neighbors that invite you over for a barbecue and you borrow their, their lawnmower um, and, you know, they, they clean your drive or stuff like that. You can, you can rely on them when you're gone to, like, make sure, you know, that nobody's going to break into your house. But, frankly, you're not really that close to them. And um, there may be things about them that you're not into. And this would be a lot of people at work, I think, too. And then there's the pleasurable. There's, there's people that we're friends with because we enjoy their company or we do fun things together. Like, maybe we play a sport with them or... Um, you know, they're, they're the funny person. Or in a lot of cases where we like people who are attractive to be around or the person who can actually play a musical instrument or something like that, um, we, we get pleasure from it. And that's good. And so I give you some examples here, like eating food together, right? Um, a lot of uh, sexual relations are probably like that. Um, and then Aristotle talks about a different kind of friendship that's much more rare. As a matter of fact, some people may not be capable of this. Everybody's capable of a friendship in terms of the useful or in terms of the pleasurable, but only good people or people who are striving for goodness are capable of the friendship of the noble or the fine. Um, and, and I think that, you know, like we, Aristotle doesn't talk about this very much, um, but if you think about like a marriage, right, a marriage might actually start out as something where it's a friendship of the useful, you know, we talk about uh, marriages of convenience, or it might be pleasurable, and then as intimacy grows, and the people get to know each other, and maybe in some cases actually have to turn into good people, um, they're capable of having a much deeper kind of friendship. And non-erotic friendships can become um, deep in that sense as well. And so the, the question then is, 
what kind of friendship do these guys have? And a lot of that depends on what we make of their moral character, uh, which is another topic that I wanted to, to get into. But I, I wanted to talk first about the, the notion of friendship itself. And, you know, another thing that was brought up quite a bit in the ancient world, um, and I think it's a live issue today, um, you know, what is the value of friendship? Do we, you know, we all want to say, oh, we want to have friends, right? But why? Do we want, do we want friends just for the useful or, or just for the, the pleasurable? Or do we, you know, with the, 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 the noble or the fine, you know the person for who they are. You appreciate them for who they are rather than just the fact that they can make you smile or, um, you know, get you tickets to something or, or whatever, right? I've had this discussion before with friends and... The, the noble friend, one of the things at the level, the level of the noble friend yeah. is also a level of commitment. Yeah, very true. And you can only have in your life so many people at that level. Yeah. Because that's the level where your friend gets cancer and you bring them meals every day. That's, <laughs> you know? that's a big test, yeah. That's, the, yeah. You know, that's the noble, somebody that you're so connected to, and they would do the same for you. Yeah. But the commitment to that psychologically, you can't have that many people at that level yeah. and stay sane. <laughs> well, you can't have that many people, period, because there's not enough time. You can't. You, know. you cannot have uh, that kind of level of commitment except to just a few people. Yeah. I mean, we see something where it can be widened a little bit with, like, you know, religious communities, right, or, or other intentional communities. But then but, you have other people carrying the burden. Even that is tough, though. Yeah. I mean, if you, when you read monastic literature, the monks sometimes like don't like each other, and they they you know trying to screw each other over and pull tricks on each other. Nuns too do that sort of thing to each other, uh, and it happens interestingly like across the entire religious spectrum, not just Christians, but Buddhists, Hindus. You know, you read the literature for them, and they all have problems mm-hmm. doing that. Um, Saint Augustine actually tried to have something like that with his his friends, an intentional community, where, where they are like, we're all going to study, you know, rhetoric, philosophy, history, we're going to live together, like a, sort of like a commune, and um, he said it worked good a lot of the time, but but even then there was, there's still quarrels. And well, stuff you're put like in that. that situation as opposed to choosing a friendship. I mean, when you're choosing... Yeah. To, and and you, is it somebody you're really, really attracted to? You have a lot in common with. You're really, <clears throat> you're drawn to that. And then, you know, the, the benefits are that, you know, you, it helps with your loneliness. It helps you live longer. You've got somebody to always go. You've got somebody yeah. always there. You know that pers- there's somebody always there and that you're never going to be alone. That's that's the commitment as opposed to being in, in a big community. You're kind of stuck there and, and you know, you're going to have friendships but not... Not that kind of commitment, like you said, that you're there. Yeah, you constantly. can have lots of people at the pleasure, yeah. pleasant level, yeah. and at the useful level. Yeah, you can have a lot of those connections. And that's friends with a small F instead of a capital F. Yeah, or think about like how many well, friends, you, how many friends you can have on, more on Facebook. Yeah. There are more acquaintances. Well, <coughs> Facebook, I mean, but yeah. the person you want to call at three o'clock in the morning because you just had a god awful dream. I mean, that's the person that you, you know, is a friend. That's the noble. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's the capital F friend. Yeah. <laughs> Do you call your friends at... No, I don't. <laughs> that's, really that's, don't. that's really putting... That's I mean, really, I, was, I was making an yeah, extreme example. An example. Uh, but yeah, you're, you know, Aristotle, one of the other things that he says about friends is, um, he says this in in a later part of the Nicomachean Ethics, that they, um, they share in each other's joys and they share in each other's sorrows <clears throat> or, or pains or griefs. You know, and, and that's exactly what you're talking about. You, you find out who your real friends are when everything goes to crap, you know, and it's interesting. One of the one of the psalms, uh, I forget which one it is. It's fairly early on because I, cause I Thomas Aquinas wrote a commentary on that one, and he he died before he finished Psalm fifty four. So I know it's got to be in the first fifty or so. It's about like it's a, this lament about how this guy was really really close to his friend, and his friend screwed him over. You know, his friend wasn't there for him <coughs> when when he needed. You see that in the book of Job. Oh, well, his friends. Now. Yeah, I mean, who yeah. needs friends like those? <laughs> giving <laughs> consolation. Well, I mean, it doesn't mean that the friends at the pleasure level and the useful level don't care about each other. Yeah, no, you're right, yeah. They it's feel just, affection. It's, it's just a different level of commitment. Yeah, yeah and, and um, it's a different motivation. 
you're, you're, you're friends with somebody because they're pleasurable, so when they stop being pleasurable, then the friendship can, can die, unless you're the guilty sort who just keep them around forever. And Aristotle actually says, <coughs> you know, useful friendships, when they're no longer useful, uh, it's actually good for you to let it go. You know, you shouldn't try to, like, make it last forever. And I think one of the big problems that people get into, especially young people these days, is this notion that if I make friends with somebody, I have to be friends with them forever, you know, and not let, you know, when people change, let things die. But Fawford and, and the Grey Mouser, they, they really have found companions um, in each other. Um, <clears throat> another, another thing, so let's talk about this, this. Are they good people? Um, they are rogues. They prey on, on the thieves. So that, I think there's maybe some justification, right? Sort of like... Um, the Robin Hood. Robin Hood, yeah. Except like, that they don't give they don't to the give poor. <laughs> I mean, not, not so much even giving to the poor, but just that whole idea of your basic... You, you're, you're kind of, they, they at your ethos, a, a good person, but you... But you still carry out these, you know, <coughs> things for even if it's only for your own gratification. But you still, yeah. bottom line, you're not going to go out and and do something horrible like murder and think that you may you may. There are some maybe. limits for them. Yeah. Um, but they are, <coughs> they are um, perfectly willing to. If they, somebody gets in a fight with them, kill them. Um, they do steal from merchants an awful lot. There's a lot of things like, you know, they don't have horses. That guy's got horses. We're taking those horses. You know. Um, and they steal uh, valuable items too, uh, pretty routinely, from from you know rich merchants and people like that. Do they have any <laughs> code of honor at all? <coughs> I was going to say, if you're stealing from rich merchants, is there an undercurrent of? Yeah. They're not. They got rich because they're not pro to totally honest. Well, nobody so they're is. Not you know, they're nobody not, who's rich is totally honest. They're not honest great people. No. They're yeah. not great people anyway. So yeah. why not? Yeah, and. and um, I mean, they, in a way, they are job creators because when they have money, they spend it on like buying things for you know women that they're involved with, um, getting drunk, uh, <laughs> fancy food, uh, you know, trinkets and stuff like that. As a matter of fact, there's some discussion in there uh, between Fawford and the Grey Mouser at one point, like in the third book. Why, why, if we make so much money, don't we have any money? <laughs> <laughs> and Fawford is like, well, you spend it on this. And the Grey Mouser is, well, you spend it on this. Sort of like a married couple, you know. Why don't we, why are, why are, you know, why is there no money in the bank? Well, you know, you spent it on this. They're, they're, they're like that. So, I mean, they are, you know, you could say they are benefiting the economy, right? And they don't prey on the poor generally. Um, you see a similar theme in Anne Rice's vampire books. Okay. Because her vampires only prey on bad people. Like Dexter? Yeah, yeah. They, well, it's even even more so. Even more so. They they only prey on... They have they have this code. So they have some code of ethics. They have a code of ethics. They have a code of ethics, code of ethics yeah. that they, they don't cross. They will not prey on right. innocent people. So it's sort of like it, there's, there's lines, right? And so long as you don't go outside of those lines, you're not going to be subject to the rogue or the vampire, whoever, going after your stuff. But once you've gone past that, now you're fair game. Is, mm -hmm. is that the idea? Well, it's like it, they only prey on evil, the evil people. Yeah. Like um, people who are, are violent robbers and things yeah. like that. That's that's who they prey on. They don't prey on on innocent blood. They don't take innocent so like blood. More vigilante sort of things. Like they're Not so much vigilante as people. if I've got to feed, I'm going to feed on somebody who doesn't contribute to this world <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> very well. You know... If you think about what we value as character traits in people, so these guys are both generous. Um, <clears throat> they're both um, loyal, you know, to people that, that don't cross them and they're loyal to each other. And they're loyal to their, their, their women that they're involved with. Um, well, Fafa not at first to, to this, this girl that he gets pregnant and leaves a child behind. Um, but everybody else he is. Uh, what other characters? What are the other characteristics? You can't say that they're just because they are doing unjust things. Um, they're fairly temperate. I mean, they get drunk every once in a while, but they're not like raging drunks. Um, they do have a sort of code of ethics. Yeah, I mean, so they, they would be the kind of people that somebody like Aristotle would say they're not virtuous, but they have they're like 
they have a tendency towards virtue, you know. Um, or Cicero would say that they have the outlines of virtue or vestiges of virtue within them. And we can recognize that and see that as, as good. But I think that, <clears throat> you know, as readers, it's very easy for us, and this happens, I think, a lot in TV shows and other stories as well, for us to say, well, I like this character, even though they're, if I th really think about it, they're not a morally good person. I really do like them, and I want them to succeed against whoever they're, they're facing. Who might have a more just claim to, you know, be in charge or have have money or things like that. But we, we what is it about the the rogue that we we get drawn in? I mean, think about like Indiana Jones, right? We root for Indiana Jones. But he's not a good guy, you know. He uh, seduced, uh, you know, what's what's her name at one time, and he, he, you know, he basically keeps his hands off his students, but he's perfectly willing to, like, you know go in and take, you know, ancient artifacts out of places. Um, he might be doing it to try to save them from other people who are going to sell them, but he's put, willing to play fast and loose. But we look, we, we're like, oh, he's a great guy, you know? I'd like to be like him, or I hope he wins, or things like that. And I think we do the same thing with these guys. So, you know, what's what's behind that? Is it that, that you know, maybe... Telling a story gets us out of the moral frame of mind, or? Well, think about, I mean, people had these big ethical dilemmas over The Sopranos. Oh, a example. good example. You yeah, get, like, yeah. so completely behind, like, Tony and his family and, yeah. you know, all well, of these characters. The characters in The Godfather. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Walter yeah. and Breaking Bad. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's another great example. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, we yeah. loved it when he was the one who knocked, right? We're all like, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. He's you finally know, got his... So what he was doing is... Come because we have structure. Yeah. Rules. Parameters. And which these, are floating. These guys can just go... And sometimes mm -hmm. maybe just people will feel too restricted, so then, you know, you just want to sort of... Break Exercise or test the limits or reset the limits or whatever they may be. So you say, well, this might be an interesting episode because... Yeah. You know, so you do something. It's an event. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So well, the, and I think that's. I think the ethics have become over time more and more relativistic. Yeah. It's relative. Mm -hmm. What is good and what is not good, and how far can you go? In some in ways, it, it is that way, and in other ways, it's more puritanical. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you were to write um, some of the stuff that we've been reading, if you were to write it today, um, given how some of the characters. Um, arrange, you know, sort of uh, orient themselves in terms of like how they treat people of different genders or races. Uh, you would just get torn apart, you know, on mm -hmm. Twitter and all these things. They'd be like, "Oh, you, this, this person." Or, I mean, the, the right would be like, "Oh, we should read these books," you know, uh, the far right. But everyone else would be going after you. So I think, in some respects, there's there's less play for some things, you know. Um, I mean, think about like the Me Too movement, you know, um, people who get swept up in that. And I think, you know, in many ways, it's, it's a good thing that it's happening, but people who get swept up in it, now they can't have a career at all. And we have to like take them out of movies and stuff like that. We're making these very strong aesthetic judgments on, on moral grounds, you know, that maybe, you know, 10 years from now, people are going to look at us and they're going to be like, well... That was uh, an interesting episode, you know. Well, well I think that's some it's, of the it's, French it's ladies feedback back from 80. <laughs> is saying it's a new Puritanism. Yeah. So they're saying no, that's not. Well, us you know French. what it is? It's because it's been since yeah. the dawn of civilization, women have been yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And if there's a little overkill right now, so sad, too bad because it's correcting. You know. Yeah, I'm not complaining. No, I know I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm I'm doing well, this gen in general, not yeah. not to think, but I mean. That's, I think, what's happening is that, it's, like you say, we're coming back from 80, and when the pendulum swings so far down, it goes way the other way yeah. before it equalizes. Right now, it's swinging the other way, and then before it equalizes, just because it Do you think been, it will come back and equalize? It always well, does. All things do. It always all does, all yeah. Do. <laughs> I think the erasure is an interesting concept, though, because there's morally corrupt people in every oh, yeah. area of yeah. society. Yeah. If there is a society, there's moral corruption. Mm -hmm. And if there's a power dynamic, there's an oppressed class. And that's just always been the case. But it's fascinating that people are being literally, you know, digitized out 
of scenes in film the same way that they did. I mean, when I lived in New York City and the towers came down and then suddenly you're seeing oh, movies yeah. that were set to come out. Right. And there was this collective, like, we must protect people from the potential psychological trauma. I'm seeing the towers. And they, I think it was Superman and he was supposed to be, out. or Spider-Man, he was, yeah. And, yeah. and you're just like, you can't do that. Like, that was my skyline for 20 years. Yeah. Like, you don't just remove them. Yeah. There I was one movie that where that they, was... they, they thematized that and it wasn't a great movie. But I liked that about the movie. It was called, I think, The 25th Hour. It had Edward Norton in it. Oh, right, and they, yeah. And like, go past, and you yeah, see yeah. where they, and, it, and it's sort of like a, I forgot about that. Uh, a stubble, almost. Like, but you know, we're, we're rewriting things. There's a lot written ways. about psychologically human humanity tends towards black-white. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tends towards simple rules. It's got to be this way, or it's got to be that like way. Like good-bad. The living in the, dualism. The living yeah. in the gray... Yeah. It's hard. It's for, too unsettling. It's hard people for most people. people. Most people don't live in the gray. Well, these guys are definitely. Yeah. I mean, gray and monsters. They're gray. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. I mean, but that's difficult for an awful lot of people. If you always need answers, you're never going to want to be, you know, in, in a non-dual situation. But in that gray, as you can just find out. I mean, you just can experience so much more, and yeah. you learn so much more. But it's, it is so difficult for most people. A lot of people, it is. Yeah. Yes. And you know because you think there's right and wrong. Well, okay, so it's wrong. It's wrong to rob a bank, but is it wrong for that person who wants that money? It's right for him. So I mean, if you start looking at all of these things from all these different perspectives, pretty soon you're gonna be like, yikes! You know, well, it's like Le Miserable. It was wrong to steal a loaf of bread. That, yeah, but if you steal a loaf of bread to feed your sister's children, right? <laughs> it wasn't wrong for him. You know, well, like yeah. when, you, when you start to look at a non-dual situation, like. It's like nothing. So, you know, yeah, it's, when, when you talk about like the, you, there's two ways things could be gray like that. One is like, so you got black over here and white over here, and then like, you know, gray in the middle, like when you were kids and we had to do all those color things, remember mm-hmm. in art class? But the other way is with like, uh, what they call, you know, charoscura, which is mm-hmm. where you've got like, things still are black and white, but the black and the white are like so closely bound up with each other that they look gray. And I think a lot of things really are gray like that, where we, we, we can't make a decision unless we're actually in the situation, because then we're close enough where we can see, aha, here's the white part, here's the black part. You know, uh, Isn't it, is it Aquinas with the principle of double effect? Or something like that, where like, if you make a decision that appears on the surface to be... Well, that has to do with consequences and whether you intend the consequences or not. Um, so... No, it's, a, no. it's Thomas, yeah, Thomas Aquinas. Um, Abelard talks about the intention of an act is, is entirely what makes it right. Mm-hmm. So he, he would also say, I mean, there could be some things where the consequences turn out not good, but you didn't intend those consequences. You intended something that brought about those consequences, but you weren't intending that. Like, uh, I mean, a lot of the mistakes that we make, um, well, you know, like think about traffic, right? You you intend just to like stop your car from skidding. You had no you know intention of like swerving off the road and hitting that person, mm. but that was the consequence. And like if you had a better view of what was going on, you probably could have foreseen that that was going to happen. But in the situation, you, you couldn't actually. Well, you see it a foresee. lot in government yeah. regulation because <laughs> government regulations are put yeah. in place yeah. for a particular yeah. good reason. But, well, sometimes good but reason. <laughs> generally, generally. Yeah. Yeah. But there are so many variables yeah. that the unintended consequences yeah. can be devastating. Mm. Be- well, if you don't think far enough ahead and if you don't take into yeah. account all the different variables that are in play. Yeah. And there, I, I there's a, really, a number of laws that... <laughs> there's a really... That problem is a process issue that there's no feedback correction. When things yeah. are written, they're locked. And it's then hard to sort of... Well, there's a feedback correction loop, but that goes back to the black and white. It's like, we wrote it, we must follow it. Yeah. It's, you know, this is the law, we can't change it. There's a good distinction that gets made today between, you know, it's a software thing, whether something is a feature or a bug, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Some government decisions, unintended consequences happen, and they seem to be like bugs. Others... It's almost like it's set up. Yeah, you know, like if you think about like trying to use, um, uh, we'll just use an example. Trying to use uh, the uh, healthcare exchange, right? Um, it seems almost as if the system is set up to make it difficult for people to navigate through it, 
And I don't, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but it strikes me that a, that a government that wants to save money could very easily decide to do things that way, you know, with, you know, they are intending that, that consequence, I think, in a lot of cases. Well, what um, you get into with things like that is you get into things that are created because of political negotiation. Right, right. So in order to solve... Oh, yeah, and that makes it even worse. serve both yeah. parties yeah. in interests, yeah. you get something that's far more complicated than it needs to be. Yeah. And that's what happened with ACA. Yes. Oh, I know. The, con the, the negotiations that happened created far more complexity than was it originally intended. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me go back to the gender relations, because that was one of the things I wanted to talk about. So, so Lieber is writing in a time that we don't think of as you know, particularly enlightened, right, early on. But, uh, this is from, this is from uh, a blog post, Advanced Readings in D&D &D, Fritz Lieber by Mordecai Knoda. Um, I think he's right about this. He says, Lieber, Lieber, Liebers, ladies, um, are generally on the positive end of the spectrum. They're defined by their roles as romantic foils, but they're not negative roles. They have agency, typically in service to either narrative fiat or the agenda of the antagonists. And they're almost always weird, he says. By way of example here, the women in question are the invisible nude godlings who live on the mountain. They reveal themselves to Grey Mouser and Fawford by covering themselves in paint or in lace. Uh, pin up, sure, but not offensive. They aren't even the weirdest ones for a while. Gray Mouser is involved with an albino were rat, and Fawford dates a ghoul whose flesh and organs are transparent, leaving only her skeleton visible. Eventually, and this is this happens really late in the game, um, Fawford and and um, the Gray Mouser settle down with two female counterparts, um, Sif and Afriat. Um, <clears throat> and as this guy says, these are the best of Lieber's women. Um, as the Lankmar stories evolve, so did his characters. And he's right about that, because that last book, and they're actually there in the, the second to last book, too, <clears throat> they actually become main characters, um, which is interesting. So you, you look at Lieber, he's writing this towards the end of his life. Um, what was going on with his, his thought about this? Well, you know, he always had female characters who, who were, had a lot of agency. Um, the, the woman who, who Fawford winds up uh, being involved with at the very start, um, I forget her name right now, um, she, uh, you know, she's really on the same level as Fawford. Unfortunately, she dies right away. Um, ah, Vlana, that's right. And when, interestingly, when uh, Vlana and the Grey Mouser's fiancé die, because the thief guild has a sorcerer who like has these things come in and strangle them uh, and then the, the place collapses um, they they don't really have anything to do with women for a long time they they are so bereaved over the loss of, of their uh, um, their loves who they both intended to settle down with um, that for a long time it's just them uh, on their own um, that changes later on but I think it's kind of an interesting point, you know. There are a lot of, I mean, quite frankly, just misogynist uh, portrayals of women. You know, one of the, one of the extreme, ex I mean, Robert Howard is not very good with that sort of thing, I'll say. And, um, you know, I don't remember who wrote the Gore series, but those are really, really over the top. Do you remember the name of? No, it's polar opposite of what I'm interested in. Yeah. Well, those, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at that point, it's kind of... It's so Michael Moorcock actually thought that those gore books should be put, like, in, in drugstores, they should be put on the same, like, hidden rack as pornography. Well, you know? it's BDSM, basically. Yeah. Just um, secondary world fantasy version. Yeah. Which... <laughs> Glitzed up with a bit of plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting point. The last thing I wanted to talk about was this whole religion. You can't even call it a religious system, because system implies that there's some sort of order to, to religion in, in Lankmar. Um, instead, you've got, um, well, in Nuhan, you, you've got all this stuff going on, all these different cults, all these different um, gods coming into existence, 
Uh, Lieber actually says most of them start as human beings who something happens to them and then people start worshiping them. And, and through the act of worship, they acquire some, some power. And the more worshipers you have, the more power you have. But even the most uh, strongly worshiped gods don't have enough power to like overpower the other gods, although they sometimes try. And within um, Lankmar itself, there's like a whole pecking order. You know, you start out at this, this gate, um, and as you make your way up the, the street, you become more and more important. And you, and you might actually, like, rent or buy out one of the temples of one of the gods who fell on hard times. Sort of like how we buy people's foreclosed houses, you know? That's exactly what's good. So think of it as like a religious marketplace, right? Um, which, in, in religious studies, they actually do use that, me that metaphor of, like, market share to talk about denominations. And it works here. Well, you see, um, yeah, you can, you can see that if you go back on mythology, the... Norse mythology, Greek yeah. mythology, those gods got supplanted over time Yeah. By other approaches. Although, what about cases like the Romans where they swept into Greece and they really like these guys? We named them. We'll take them. <laughs> well, does that happen? Well, some of them were similar already, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah and they're the, parallel. Some and and parallel. they had a few of their own, like, you know, Giannis and, uh, um, well, of course, you know, the. the, the yeah, but were some of those Etruscan? Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. But, I mean, but the people were, go ahead. picking up other belief systems is happens a lot. Yeah. I mean, the, the <laughs> yeah. Greeks were doing that too. The Christ, Christians, Christians did that. They picked up holidays that the Romans had and said, oh. "Okay, now it's our holiday." Well, that was yeah. that was very because, convenient because yeah. you had a day off. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, that that has there. It also went on with religious sites too. So, like you know, I, I've been reading um, Bede's history of the English Church and people. And in it, he talks about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Romans and the Britons and the Saxons coming in and all that. And um, when the church comes in uh, with this, this, this guy, Augustine, um, not, not the, the Augustine that we think about, Augustine of Hippo, but another Augustine, um, there's a deliberate decision, and it's in one of the letters of, of one of the Gregories. It might be Gregory the Great. And he says, um, don't knock the temples down. Because that's, he doesn't say it like this, but I'm going to paraphrase it. That's good real estate, you know. And plus, people are used to going there already. So, you know, um, you can rededicate it, you There's know. There's a cathedral in Syracuse in Sicily. Yeah. That the very base of it is, is a worship site from about 5000 B.C. Wow. On top of that was built a Greek temple. Okay. And now it's a, a Catholic cathedral. Yeah. But the Greek pillars are still in the church. Interesting. So they built around the Greek temple. Yeah, yeah. This Catholic cathedral. Yeah. But everything is still there from I mean, the previous worship sites. There are mosques Spain, like that too. Yeah, well, in Spain where they yeah. were in the Moors, where they have the mosque, and, and then the, and then started with then there was Jew, Jewish temple in there. Now it's it's now a Christian or yeah. a Greek Orthodox. Yeah, yeah. it's an Istanbul. Yeah. Istanbul. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christian in Orient. Yeah, it was the high of Sophia. They're all statues because they didn't want the Christians to and smash them all up, so that's one of the few places where they actually have statues. Well, they Greeks, they Greeks. Yeah. So the, the gods, there's a whole bunch of them. And, you know, when we think about, like, polytheism, right, we, we often think, well, there's a pantheon of the gods, and, you know, like, this one does this, and this one does that. It's not even remotely organized like that in, in, in uh, Nuhan and Lankmar. It's sort of like whatever your God can like take over and get away with, you know, or whatever they want to, that's, that's what they do. And so they try to get supporters. Um, and, and the gods play, a, a, you know, important roles. Um, there's other things that are not gods but are powers. Um, necessity, chance, death. Death himself shows up in some of the stories and says, you, you know, Fafford the Great Monster, you do great work for me, you know. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's things like that going on. Um, and and it, it's kind of funny. I think he's kind of spoofing religion in, in a lot of cases. There is also one set of gods who I mentioned a little bit earlier, and these are very serious. These are the gods of Lankmar, very ancient they save the day in one of the in the in the novel, um, uh, the one where where we're just talking about you know 
the gray mouser actually does become a rat, and, and, and uh, there's like a conspiracy of rats to take over. The gods come out of, this, of, of their, their temple um, and, and, you know, save the day. But you don't want to wake up the gods of Lankmar. And as a matter of fact, <clears throat> if you get to Uppity as like a, a new god, um, the gods of Lankmar will, will take care of you and kill all your priests and, you know, you'll just disappear. So you don't want to you don't want to mess with them, you know. Uh, and there's even interesting things like early on in in the series, the thieves guild, um, they you know they have all these old skulls, which are the the you know sort of disembodied consciousnesses, essentially the gods of their old um, rulers of the thieves guild, the, the the guy in charge, and. The new thieves, they're all like, that's all superstition, that's BS, we don't believe in any of that crap. Um, well, the, the, the gods actually come and take care of some of them. And, and then they start worshipping them again. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, he really weaves it in there in an interesting way. Fawford, be, Fawford does believe in, in two gods. Uh, Isaac of the Jug, who he becomes the acolyte of, and the other god from his, his ancestral homeland, and um, there's another god who's interested in the Grey Mouser, but they don't, they're not, you know, other than the period where Fawford himself is, is an acolyte, they're not very devout. And their gods don't have much pull at all. <laughs> you know, so they can't do much of anything for them. Um, that's kind of a funny, you know, little thing. But a lot of people are very invested in, in that world, in, in worship. As a matter of fact, I'll also mention this. Um, the Grey Mouser, I mentioned that Fawford and the Grey Mouser split apart at one point. So the Grey Mouser becomes an extortioner. He, can, he becomes an extortioner for a guy who specializes in extorting from religious cults and their practitioners. Um, and eventually that guy converts and becomes a devotee of Isaac of the Jug. And um, he still extorts everybody else, you know. Because he's not going to stop making money, and he figures that way he's doing doing a good job for for his god, um, and so there's a lot of sort of moral compromises that people can get into, where their values seem you know a little bit strange when it comes to religion. But uh, it's quite interesting. There's, there's there's also a goddess in one of the stories, who um, reestablishes her um, worship by having her crows come in and, and steal all of the, the jewels and, and peck the faces of these these women who are not worshiping her as they, they ought to be um, and, and, and tries to get you know her, her thing started, although Fafford and the Grey Mouse are defeat her. So I think that's kind of a, an interesting theme. I don't quite know what to make of it myself, um, but it is an important part of their, their world. Well, there are several authors who incorporate that kind of religious... What should we call it? I want to call it. It's not even polytheism because polytheism well, it, implies some sort of structure well, or order, you know. It, it but it, it strikes me as mockery of what we experience in real life, in terms of um, in denominations. Oh. Like Luther, yeah, like yeah. Lutheran Church are rising. Yeah. And Wesley with the Methodist Church, you know, the different denominations have Smith, the Mormonism. Yeah. That there's somebody at the head of those movements and other people make more of them yeah. than they ever intended to be. Um, and sometimes I think when in some in various authors that they're taking shots at how American denominationalism. Not just American, no, worldwide. Just how we as hum humanity yeah. um, approaches Religion. I mean, we've kind of got the market cornered, though. As if you think about religious history in terms of just like the sheer like plethora of no, denominations just, yeah. that we have, uh, in part because we didn't have an official church, you know. Like so, I mean, if you're in Germany, um, there are lots of different religious people, right? But the three main denominations were Catholic, Lutheran, and, and Reformed. And then they had a yeah, but with the yeah, that's because you have a state religion. Yeah, yeah. You also have to consider the diversity of the immigrants that came here. That's true. Yeah. yeah. 
they yeah, do that you one o'clock with them. Yeah. So, um, whereas you have much more homogeneous But a lot of them developed here, too, though. You know, they did, yeah. You know, like, the denominations kind of splitting off from each but, other and stuff. Yeah, there was a freedom to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every world religion has split-offs. All of them do. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say as much as Christianity, though. You know. Yeah. Christianity has more... And, and specifically Protestant Christianity, you know, because I mean, if you take all the earlier churches, pre-Protestant churches, um, you know, you've got a bunch of different Orthodox churches, but they're all part of one communion. You've got the Roman with a bunch of different rites, all part of one communion, and then you've got about seven or eight other smaller, further east churches like the Coptic, the you know, the various Syriac ones. Mm -hmm. um, the Armenian Church, the Ethiopian Church, and, and that's that's pretty much it. And that covers like almost everybody. And then you've got over ten thousand different Protestant denominations. Mm -hmm. So it's really on that one side. That's, be, that's because there seems to be a state of mind in Protestantism that well, if we disagree, we'll just form another church. Yeah, they call it, uh, uh, one of the neighbors called it the Protestant principle. Of, mm -hmm. you, you know, you disagree. Okay. Yeah. Well, a perfect example I use, I, I, I use, I've taught some religion classes. A perfect example I use is uh, Amish and Mennonite, yeah. particularly Amish. You can find so many different groups within the yeah. Amish, and frequently they broke off because they didn't like that, they didn't think that bonnet was appropriate. Yeah. Or that type of dress was too appropriate. Modern. Too, <laughs> too modern, too fancy. Yeah. Too um, and they would split. Yeah. into a different group. Um, and we're seeing it today in mainline churches over gender issues, yeah. things like that. And people are going, rather than work out our differences, we'll just split it. Yeah, I mean, once you've established the thing that if you don't like it, you can split, it's harder to hold people in there. There know? is one world religion that prohibits splitting. What is that? Baha'i. Oh, they yeah. They actually yeah. have a rule. Although they haven't been around that long, so... No, they, but they actually yeah. have a rule that says... You have to work out your differences. You don't get to split off. Okay. They're the only world religion that has that principle. Catholics tried it and it didn't a lot of work. Yeah, they didn't work well. They were throwing each other anti public Yeah, they didn't work well. Yeah. Heretics. <laughs> well, and you, you, you've got all these different rites, too, even within the, the Catholic within Church. Within the Catholic Church. Yeah. So that allows some diversity. And I mean, the thing is, within the Catholic Church, you, you get a lot of arguments from one side or the other about just about that. how do you do the liturgy? What songs should there be? And all that. And, uh, you know, everyone's, everyone's, it's sort of like everybody's stuck in the same big bag and have to fight it out, but nobody ever really wins. You know? I mean, it's totally different than what's going on in, in these stories. Uh, that's more like the Protestant, you know, sort of, like, and not just the Protestant spectrum, you know, it's, it's not the more sedate stuff. It's sort of like, imagine all of the different denominations that only have a few believers are all sort of battling it out, you know, the ones that are newer and, mm -hmm. and more willing to scrap with each other, I guess. What's that got to do with... Swords and sorcery? No, religion, no, <laughs> stuff that you're scrapping about. Well, they're trying to get worshippers. They're, they're worshippers, yeah, they're right. right. Well, yeah. I know, but I mean, if the basic tenets of going back to Christianity, ah. going back to the Christ, what's that? What's any of that got to do with the basic teaching principles of which all this was supposedly founded on? Yeah. Now, well, well, much much of that much of that disparity has to do with somebody saying it's an interpretation. We've gotten it wrong over the years. We we've, we've strayed from well, the real teaching. Yeah. We need to get back to where. Well, yeah. That's the I thing, though. When we when we think about religion, because we we're from you know the the era that we are, we we tend to think okay, Christianity that's the paradigm. But you know, many of the, the religions that have been practiced, it wasn't quite so so elevated. It was well, it, it, literally, it was in Latin. It's do with des. I give so that you give something back to me. I'm going to sacrifice so you give me some good crops or you know uh, a beautiful you know spouse or it's relationship. you know yeah the, the exactly. Friendship with usefulness with your gods. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because well, yeah, they're not pleasant. And you even have that with Protestantism, the concept of... Oh, like, um, what do they call it? The uh, intercessory prosperity prayer. gospel. And the prosperity mm -hmm. gospel, yeah. intercessory prayer. Yeah. yeah. I pray, and therefore I get he this back. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. And the, the, yeah, the prosperity gospel. So, so maybe he's 
making fun of that in a way or just, just playing around with the idea. Or, you know, maybe he's just taking stuff from I the way things were in the ancient world. I, 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 sometimes a lot of authors play around with what they see in modern day religion when they start putting and satirize it. Maybe a little satire, maybe yeah. a little look at it from a different angle. I mean, Herbert, I mean, this, this is like an antipodes from Herbert, you know. With Herbert, religion really is important, although he's he's not a believer himself, and you know, uh, Bible. has yeah, I mean, has the potential like totally change the universe and its political structure. These guys don't, you know, but they don't really Herbert, change anything. But even with Herbert, his Orange Catholic Bible and everything is based on power yeah and controlling the population. Yeah, well, and an ecumenical ecumenical project of bringing everybody back out of the same page trying to overcome diversity mm -hmm. and there's nothing to, to I mean the, there is every once in a while like a god who gets uppity and says like I'm going to be the one god but that never works in, in, in this book so yeah well we're at about 8.30 so we should wrap it up um, thanks for another great discussion 